Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no hollow, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hi, Dan. I'm Who are I'm, you? I'm Lindsay the Elf. Was, Lindsay that, you, was that your stomach? It, it was... No, I was hoping to move past it. It was a noise. I just drank water right before the show started, and it came back out, and I was hoping you wouldn't acknowledge it. Last week, a similar mm-hmm. thing happened, and I acknowledged it, and mm-hmm. I think that you should just know going forward, I'm never not going to acknowledge it. Sweet, because I can't help it. I know. <laughs> that, doesn't, that doesn't make it not funny. <laughs> okay, and you are Lindsay. I'm Lindsay, and I don't gurgle. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> great. Happy holidays <laughs> to those of you who just finished celebrating Hanukkah, uh, to those celebrating Christmas, and to everyone else. Got a got a sassy co-host today. Oh, man. Uh, no announcements today for, for me other than happy holidays. I have an announcement. What's your announcement? My announcement is that Sophie, our producer, yeah. you know, who helps curate the stories and all of that, mm-hmm. she, um, she lives in New Orleans. You know that. I don't know if you guys know this. And she sent us like a really awesome care package of stuff from Nola. Yeah, went to an authentic voodoo shop, and she sent us this. And I, I was dying reading this. I just I was like, this is hysterical. <laughs> Doctor Pryor's hot foot powder. Uh huh. Sounds like it sounds like something to curse somebody with. Make their feet hot, maybe. Okay, well, I thought it was me loving skincare. I was like, ooh, like a hot foot bath. Like a voodoo hot foot bath. Yeah, like maybe to suck the demons out of you. I don't know. (laughs) On the back of it, it says, Dr. Pryor's famous special incense, which I did not pick up on an incense thing here. May the enchanting fragrance of Dr. Pryor's special formula incense satisfy your desires and bring the blessing of peace, success, and happiness to thee. Amen. In the morning... Read Psalm 26. In the evening, read Psalm 23 while the incense is burning. Okay. Vague. I, like, what does it do? Uh, right, exactly. Exactly. A little vague as far as what it's, I don't know. Maybe they just, when you buy it, maybe, I guess, maybe you just know. Maybe most people who just buy hot foot powder know that that's uh, to make your enemy's feet hot. I well, don't know. I mean, it says it's going to bring you <clears throat> peace, success, and happiness. Oh, right. So it maybe it has nothing to do with hot feet then. I know. Maybe not. <laughs> Very confusing, but I love it, and it, it cracks thank me up. Thank you, Sophie, and Thanks, thank you for the cool candle too. This little guy. So, how many how many stories, uh, Sassy oh. Elf, do you have for us today? Well, little Miss Sassy Pants over here has three stories. Okay, <laughs> three stories. Okay, three, uh, but like all like no. little snippets. Oh, okay, okay, like, little boop, stories. Boop, boop. I, I have two lengthier stories Hi. today. Um, the la- <laughs> and and the, and the second one is a. Bit different, quite a bit different than what we normally tell here. Why? Uh, last year we started a holiday tradition <laughs> with our December twenty fourth episode. Oh yeah, that one called uh, "In the Walls." Uh, oh yeah, that had, yeah, the episode sixteen. And one of the stories in "In the Walls" was like a more modern tale. The the former at like the toy store owner mm-hmm. with the weird noise. But then the other one was this uh, classic English ghost story of Smee by A. M. Burridge. Uh, originally published in 1931 as part of a collection of spooky stories called Someone in the Room. Uh, I learned late last year that in early 20th century England, holiday ghost stories were especially popular uh, around Christmas. And, and authors would release ghost story tales around Christmas as opposed to Halloween. And, and I want to keep this UK Christmas time old ghost story tradition going. Uh, this year, going to go back a little further to the Victorian era, uh, when ghost stories extremely popular in the UK, mm-hmm. and uh, and again mostly popular around Christmas. Yeah, it was uh, twas the season for horror in the mid and late nineteenth century for many British Empire nations. So my second Christmas time tradition English ghost story is going to be the Ghosts Summons by London author Ada uh, Buisson, published originally in eighteen sixty eight. Two years after Ada died at the age of only 27. He, so young. Mm-hmm. We can find out what spooked folks in England, Ireland, and Scotland in the 1860s. Uh, and then before I t- tell our now annual tradition of telling an old UK ghost tale, mm-hmm. they used to be read aloud on December nights to a small audience of friends and family gathered around the fire. I can picture that. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'll first tell a, a more modern tale. A supposedly true example of someone playing around with the mirror box ritual. 
Oh, no. Mirrors are never good for you. Some, yeah, this is a really creepy one. Someone who stepped inside what is sometimes called the devil's toy box. And apparently they have never been the same since. I, my mind immediately went to the toy box killer. Oh, God. From Time Suck. Yikes. Yeah. yeah. David Parker Ray. Like, oh, man. Did you see my sweatshirt? You do have a great Christmas sweatshirt of okay. Santa on a unicorn riding through the galaxy past Saturn. He's, wait. <laughs> when you look at yourself, it's backwards. <laughs> Yes, it is. Oh. And I have, and I have, I don't know, fire and skulls and a, a boxing glove, maybe. It's a, it's a cat. It's a boxing cat. He's breathing flames oh. out of his mouth. There he is. Yes, he is. I have a fire breathing cat who's boxing and also skulls and Santa hats. When you when you look on Amazon <clears throat> for Christmas sweaters that have skulls on it, that, get. that was one of the things that came up and I thought it was hysterical. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> okay, I'm going to take this off because... I feel like I can't take us seriously. With the little Christmas hats? Okay. I know, but maybe it like... I got some setup while you get while you get ready here. Okay. Uh, we've talked a little bit about rituals before here on Scared to Death. Uh, we've played with the idea that, you know, with the right words, items, the proper desire to interact with something beyond what we can normally see, you just might be able to make contact with something else. Something out there in the darkness, something many don't even believe to exist. An exciting prospect for some. Nice Christmas socks. Very nice. Uh, terrifying for others. And I imagine both exciting and terrifying for many. For most of human history, we've built our spiritual lives around various rituals. Ancient rituals guided ancient humans and how they paid tribute to their gods. They relied on rituals when it came to how to please and worship them, how to make the appropriate sacrifices. And they relied on rituals to feel protected from the gods or spirits or black magic that meant them harm. Religion today continues to be built on rituals. Fair. You know, guiding the faithful and how to worship the gods of the current age. Humans still rely on rituals when it comes to where and when to pray or what to say to open a dialogue with the celestial and what to do or say in order to feel protected from evil. And there are also other darker rituals. There are rituals designed not to please some god or seek protection, but just to make contact with whatever might exist out there in the darkness where some of these gods might dwell, where who knows what else might dwell with them. There are rituals designed to connect with the dead, with ghosts, and with whatever else may live on some other plane of existence near this one. Why perform these rituals? Why risk calling out to the darkness? Because you, you're crazy. When you don't know who or what might answer back, for many reasons, I guess, maybe crazy. Uh, maybe you think you can gain something, some kind of magic or power from something you contact. Hmm. Uh, maybe you desperately just want to talk to a deceased loved one. That I get. Maybe you're just really curious. Maybe just want to know for certain that something, anything does exist out there in the darkness past what all of us can see in this world. The ritual we're talking about today, one for the intensely curious, for those not afraid to call out into the darkness. It's a ritual designed to create some sort of vortex that attracts spirits to cross over, enter our physical realm, and spirits that just might stay. Talking about the mirror box ritual, a ritual based on creating a mirror box sometimes also known as the devil's toy box. And the mirror box ritual goes like this. Oh, no, don't say it. Uh, one witness and one assistant. It's a, it's, it's a construction thing, actually, more than saying something. Uh, I one, don't know. It makes me anxious already. One witness and one assistant uh, use a box with its interior completely covered in mirrors to try and make contact with the spirit world. There should be complete trust between the witness and the partner. And both must be mentally strong. Oh, well, I guess we're out. Uh, people not, you know, uh, easily terrified or prone to panicking. Uh, to construct the devil's toy box and carry out the ritual, you'll need six large square solid sheets. Ideally, these sheets are made out of metal. Uh, the, the important thing is that they're very strong with perfectly flat faces for attaching mirrors to. Uh, the sheet should be slightly taller than the witness, but should not exceed the height of the witness with raised hands. Additionally, one sheet should be slightly taller than the other five. So building this box. For maximum effect, two sheets made out of graphite or lead alloy. Uh, six mirrors. One should be slightly larger than the other five. It, it will be the mirror placed on top of the devil's toy box. Uh, all should be as flawless as possible. The mirror should be mounted on the insides of the box, one per side, the largest mounted to the top. The mirrors need to cover the interior of the box completely. You are creating a box where every single inch of the interior is perfectly reflective. Uh, you need one light source. The source should be capable of emitting pure white or bright yellow light in all directions, should not require access to an electrical outlet to function. Candles not recommended. Uh, this light is for the witness to be able to see any visitors that may appear inside the box. Two synchronized alarm clocks. One small object for the witness to hold on to. 
The object must not be religious in any sense or a weapon. Religious items may prevent visitors, and weapons in the devil's toy box are dangerous. One would not want to be tricked by a visitor into harming themselves. There are rumors of a young woman who brought in a small knife, ended up slashing her face up severely inside one of these boxes. Uh, Supposedly, she didn't make a sound when she cut herself. She was fine when she went into the box, and then 10 minutes later, when she was let out, her face was carved up, blood (gasps) was everywhere, and she was laughing. All she would say is that uh, as she was driven to an emergency room was over and over, you'll meet it too. It just wants to make us beautiful. You'll meet it too. It just wants to make us beautiful. What the fuck? Whatever object you do bring inside the box, it should be small, something that can fit in the palm of your hand. Why bring it at all? Because often the item apparently will disappear while you're sealed inside the box, proving that your reality has been altered. Hmm. And then it will return once you leave the box. Why does that happen? No one knows. You'll also need two ladders, blankets, water, and a first aid kit. That's a lot of shit. Mm-hmm. This is a, this is an involved ritual. Yeah, you're committed. And then once you've constructed this large devil's toy box, you can begin the ritual for maximum effect beginning at night during a full uh, new moon. The witness will use the two ladders, one placed outside the box, one inside it, to enter. Once the witness is inside, the partner should hand the witness the turned off light source and the one alarm clock. The partner should keep the other alarm clock. Uh, he or she should also confirm that the blankets, water, first aid kit are easily accessible should the need for them arise. The partner and the witness should then agree on a signal to be released from the box. Once the signal is agreed upon, the witness needs to give confirmation they are ready to be sealed inside. Oh, God, no way. Once this confirmation has been received, your partner should remove the interior ladder, close the top of the box, after both the witness and the partner set their synchronized alarm clocks to go off in 10 minutes. Once the box has been sealed, the witness should turn on their light. The witness then sits down and just silently stares ahead, waiting for contact. I'm so freaked out already. And the partner or partners, if there are more than one, silently wait outside the box for either 10 minutes to pass or until they receive a signal from the witness to be let out early. Oh, boy. If the witness has not emerged by the time the alarm clocks go off, open the box and remove the witness. Do not open the box from anywhere other than the top. Do not remove the sides or the bottom. Do not break the box. The witness must not, under any circumstances, remain in the box after 10 minutes. Mm. The witness may plead to remain in the box, insisting that opening the box will be more dangerous than remaining inside. Do not listen. Do not trust anything the witness may say to convince you otherwise. Staying longer than 10 minutes can apparently lead to too much contact, to a connection too strong to ever be fully reversed. Do not allow the witness to stay inside the box. Do not believe anything they say about their experience inside the box. Be especially wary if they claim nothing happened or if they recommend that you should try it now. Do not ask them for the time or where the Antumbra meets. There is no light for the curious among you there. And the Antumbra is part of the moon shadow scene during a solar eclipse. Okay. Uh, Know that this is a dangerous ritual. To go inside the box is to risk bringing something back with you when you, uh, you know, return, when you leave the box, something that may change you forever. Going into the box may prove to you that there are absolutely worlds beyond this one, but it also supposedly might destroy you. Hmm. Time now for the tale of AJ and the Devil's Toy Box. Oh, God. I am scared already. One young man named AJ would find out just exactly how powerful the mirror box ritual is several years ago. AJ grew up in the suburbs of Chicago, and for whatever reason, around the time he and his friends became teenagers, they started to dabble in the occult. It all started when someone took out a Ouija board one night along with a few stolen beers, and pretty soon they were doing some version of of a summoning ritual almost every weekend. Mostly this ritual involved candles and AJ and one or two of his friends sitting back to back while they waited for something to emerge out of the shadows of AJ's parents' basement. Sometimes someone would say something in a low, guttural voice, and even though they knew it was one of them, they would all pretend that they'd made contact with some kind of actual demon. It seemed like harmless fun, and even their parents didn't mind. They seemed to prefer them having, uh, you know, or prefer them doing weird shit like this in AJ's family's basement instead of doing something out around the city, something that could get them hurt, maybe tossed in jail. It was all harmless fun, until of course, it wasn't. One Saturday night, a couple weeks into their senior year of high school, the trio of friends no longer needed to make some spooky sounds and pretend they just heard a demon, or try to convince themselves that some trick of light seen out of the corner of one of their eyes was a shadow person or something similar. This night, they really did make contact. 
They'd all gathered in the darkened basement and got out the Ouija board, just like they'd been doing for months now. By this point, AJ had gotten good at being able to tell when one of his friends was moving the planchette. But this time, when he looked at his two friends' faces, Jess and Tommy's expressions were both entirely slack, as were their hands, as the planchette started moving beneath them. This time it felt different. He could tell his friends were genuinely spooked and excited, and he knew he certainly wasn't moving it himself. Guys, I think it's doing something, Jess said. They all looked at each other. Was it really happening? After so many nights of never experiencing anything, they'd all begun to give up believing that a Ouija board could contact anything other than their imaginations. They hadn't been prepared for this. After a few beats of silence, Tommy cleared his throat and asked, What's your name? And the planchette, still seeming to move on its own, carefully spelled out, R. G. M. Maybe that's their initials, Jess suggested. Are there any other ghosts here? Tommy asked. The planchette quickly dragged over to, yes. Do you talk to them? AJ asked. Do they want to talk to us as well? The planchette started spelling something again. N. O. T. M. E. And then AJ's mom called down uh, that Jesse's mom was here to pick her up. Damn it. Annoyed at having to drop what seemed like their first moment of real contact, they turned the lights back on and Jess hopped up the stairs. After Jess left, AJ said to Tommy, I wonder what it meant by not me. Yeah, right? Tommy nodded, shoveling a handful of pretzels into his mouth. Does that mean it doesn't like the other ghosts for some reason? No idea, said AJ. Then they looked at each other wide-eyed and then burst into laughter. They both suddenly felt silly about the whole thing. They agreed that one of them must have been moving the planchette, or they just hadn't noticed. Maybe Jess was messing with them. After a few more attempts at making contact over the next few weeks with these entities, and never again having another similar experience, AJ packed up the Ouija board and put it away. <laughs> he and his friends' interest in the occult had faded. Tommy and AJ got jobs to save some money for college, and Jess, a varsity athlete, got busy with sports, and life moved on. And for the rest of their senior year, the three didn't see each other as much as they used to. They ended their senior year still good friends, and the following Thanksgiving, they were all back in town, home from the three different colleges they now went to. And they found themselves sitting in AJ's parents' basement again, talking about the things they used to do. Remember, we used to use that Ouija board all the time, Jess said before asking. Do you still have it? I don't know, probably, said AJ. He hadn't touched it in months. Hang on, said Tommy. I heard about something different. I heard about a ritual from one of my hallmates at school. Somehow we got on the topic of ghosts and he told me about something called the mirror box. AJ and Jess hadn't heard of it, so Tommy explained, finishing with, if the witness has any serious wounds or discoloration, we need to call for medical help. Whoa, whoa, Jess said, medical help? Like what? I don't know, Tommy said honestly. The last thing he told me was that you should happen, if you should happen to meet a witness, never trust, um, Never trust what they say about their experience and never ask them for the time or where the entumbra meets. And then he smiled and said that he was a witness. What? Jesus Christ, AJ said, this dude sounds creepy. Should we trust him or not? I don't know, Tommy said, shrugging. But I bet it would work better than a Ouija board. They all looked at each other. Then slowly, Jess said, my dad has a bunch of old mirrors because the construction company tore down a dance studio last summer. I'm down if you're down. I'm down, Tommy said. And then AJ agreed. Let's do it. They walked a few blocks to Jess's house and got the mirrors from her garage. After a few tries, they figured out how to get the mirrors positioned so they could get fastened, and luckily, or unluckily, as it might have been, Jess had picked up some construction knowledge from her dad and was able to position the boxes together safely, or the box. Then there was the matter of who would be the witness. AJ didn't know what compelled him to say, I'll do it. Oh no. But he noticed right after he volunteered that Tommy looked relieved. There was a sinking feeling in his gut, but there was no turning back now, right? Okay, cool, Tommy said. They synchronized two alarm clocks and Jess gave her necklace to AJ to hold as his item. He put it in his pocket and climbed into the box. Ready, he heard from outside. Ready, he said. And then the top of the box slid closed and AJ turned uh, on a camping style battery powered lantern. For the first 30 seconds or a minute, after that AJ lost track of time, he felt nothing. He was sitting in a big, dumb, mirrored box looking at a distorted reflection of his own face while his two friends waited for him to get out. He wished they'd maybe just played the Ouija board a bit, then went to a movie or something instead of wasting a couple of hours making this weird box. He also wished he hadn't volunteered. He hated to admit it, but it was starting to creep him out. Then, a strange feeling fell over him. 
he no longer felt like he was alone in the box. Something else was inside with him. It felt like it was towards his left, but when he moved his eyes, he couldn't see anything. The reflections made it hard to tell where he was looking, though. It was all pretty disorienting. He looked all around him and couldn't see anything. But he felt like it was there. It was the strangest sensation. And then he suddenly felt hungry. But it wasn't a normal hunger, and it wasn't his own hunger. He felt like this other thing with him was hungry. And he could feel its hunger. He could feel that it desired something so greatly that only that thing and so much of it would satisfy it. He knew the hunger wouldn't end until it had consumed what? It was not a hunger for food or drink or even any material thing. No words can properly convey what AJ was now feeling inside the devil's toy box. AJ had heard of people hallucinating sounds, sights, smells, and touches, but emotions? Could people hallucinate emotions? Slowly, as if to remind himself that he was just a person sitting in a quickly thrown together box of mirrors and not in some sort of magnet for the paranormal, his fingers crept into his pocket looking for Jess's necklace. And it wasn't there. Where was it? He turned his pocket inside out. No necklace. How could he have forgotten it? There was no way. He looked in his other pocket, scrambling, trying to find it when he locked eyes with something. Something that wasn't his own reflection hovering just over his shoulder. He couldn't rightfully call the thing in the mirror he was staring at human. It was a distortion, a shadow with two lighter spots where its eyes should have been. He now remembered that the whole point of getting in the box was to make contact. And now it seemed he'd done that. So trying to hide the intense fear he now felt, he started asking questions. What's your name? The thing just stared at him. What's your name? He asked again. And then he heard a voice. R. G. Holy shit, he thought. Was it RGM, the entity he had spoken to almost a year ago? Excited, he replied, RGM, right? Nothing in the shadowy shape changed, but AJ had the distinct feeling that it was happy. A cold current ran now through AJ's body. What the hell was going on? Oh, man. A voice in his ear whispered, Yes. He started to stand up. He wanted to be done. He wanted to be let out of the mirror box. He didn't like this anymore. This wasn't fun. He was starting to sweat. His heart was starting to race. Then he felt a hand shoved down on his shoulder hard. He dropped and was sitting back down on the floor. He didn't want to be, but he was. He couldn't stand back up. The invisible hand on his shoulder wouldn't allow it. What's going on? AJ asked aloud. He yelled, hey guys, let me out. He pounded on the side of the box. Nothing happened. Jess, Tommy, he yelled, let me out. AJ's heart was really racing. He was panicking. He worried that he was never going to get out, that he'd be trapped in this box of mirrors forever, that he'd die in this goddamn box. Now, in addition to still not being able to get back up, his body felt different, less solid somehow. What was happening? Jess! Tommy! He yelled again. Let me out! Still no reply. Now felt like his body was made of smoke. And then following a sudden urge to touch the mirror in front of him, he gasped when his hand simply passed through it. A tear rolled down his cheek. He was crying. Why was he crying? Was all of this really happening? His panicking was intensifying. Let me go, he pleaded with whatever was still touching him, trapping him. Please, he begged. Please just let me go. Then he heard the thing speak again. You gave me a name, AJ. That wasn't wise, was it? Oh, God. Names have power, AJ. Don't you know when you give something a name, it becomes personal? Mm. That it becomes more real and you become attached to it. And if you become attached to me, AJ, I can become attached to you. (laughs) And now I am attached to you, AJ, and you'll never be rid of me. Not ever. What had he done, AJ wondered. He'd only said three letters, two. He just said the first two, and and it led him to spelling the third. How was that enough to invite this, whatever this was? AJ, AJ, it's time to get out. It was Tommy. AJ could finally hear Tommy's voice from outside. He banged on the box. AJ looked up and watched his friend take the top mirror off. What happened in there? Jess asked. You were so quiet. It didn't feel like AJ was answering with his own voice when he said, I saw RGM. He wanted to scream. Couldn't you hear me in there? I was yelling to be let out. He wanted to scream, but he didn't. He didn't feel like himself. He felt like he was watching himself. Oh, damn. RGM from last winter? Jess asked. That's crazy. Did it have anything cool to say? (laughs) AJ, without meaning to, Shook his head no. Jess shrugged, told the others she was going to grab a soda from the fridge in the house and be right back. As he watched her go, AJ reached in his pocket and felt Jess's necklaces somehow mysteriously returned. Oh, man. Then again, her necklace. Then again, his will. 
Uh, then, against his will, excuse me, he crushed the necklace until he could feel the twisted metal in his hand. He felt rage. He was so angry all of a sudden. He was hungry. What was happening to him? Everything okay? Tommy asked. He had a concerned look on his face. AJ wanted to say no. Everything was not okay. Not even fucking close. He tried to scream it with his eyes, but instead he heard himself say, Yes. Hmm. <sighs> And then as Tommy turned to follow Jess into the house, AJ felt his fingers yearning to reach for Tommy's throat. Ooh. Please, he squeaked out. Please, please just let me go. Tommy turned around and seemed scared by what he was looking at. Dude, what the hell happened in there? He asked. AJ had to use all his willpower to stop himself from attacking his friend. He wanted to kill him. He wanted to kill both of them. Run, he told Tommy. Run. You're freaking me out, AJ, said Tommy. You don't look so good. Then Jess showed back up and dropped her soda in shock. As it hissed and soda bubbled out from the can on the ground, she said, AJ, what happened in there? You don't look right. As Tommy and Jess exchanged concerned glances, AJ looked over at one of Jess's father's mirrors, one of the mirrors they hadn't used to make the box, and he didn't like what he saw. His face looked off. It was still his face, but it was like the faint shadow of another face had been superimposed over the top of his own. It gave him an incredibly sinister look. And then the faint shadow went away, and then it looked like his old self again. And then it came back. And then it went away again. It just kept pulsing in and out of sight. AJ knew that what he was seeing, what his friends were seeing too, was the thing from the box. It was like part of him somehow. And it wanted him to kill his friends. AJ suddenly had the urge to visit his family's old synagogue. He hadn't been there once since he'd left for college. And really, he'd only been a few times uh, the previous year when he was in high school. But he'd always liked the rabbi and thought he might be there if he didn't wait until it got any later. Sorry, he told his friends through gritted teeth, fighting off this new dark hunger. I have to go. I have to go right now. He then ran outside and started running down the sidewalk. The synagogue was actually only about a half mile away. He ignored his friends' repeated texts and calls as he ran for a few blocks. They'd run after him before some traffic separated them further and they gave up. AJ ran all the way to the synagogue. The door was unlocked and he ran inside, running past the pews up to the bima where he began to pray and the shadow within him and the murderous anger began to subside. Hmm. His rabbi soon came in and after talking with him a bit, began to pray with him. AJ told his rabbi about the Ouija board, the mirror box ritual, all of it. And his rabbi told him to throw away the Ouija board and never, ever dabble in the occult again. They spoke together and prayed further. And by the end of their prayers, AJ felt like his old self again. That thing from the mirror, he told himself it was gone. He didn't fully believe that, but that's what he told himself. He called Jess and Tommy, told them he was done with all the occult dabbling for good. He didn't tell them what he'd seen and felt. It was just too hard to explain, and he didn't want them to worry about him or to worry about him wanting to kill them. He went back to college a few days later, and everything was fine for about two weeks. Then he woke up in the middle of the night feeling that strange hunger again. Oh, no. He suddenly wanted to go out into the hallways of his dorm and kill the first student he saw. He knew that would end his hunger. Actually, he didn't want to do that. He thought that was crazy. Whatever was still inside of him did. He hopped down from his bed and flipped on the light in his room, looked at himself in the mirror, and there it was, the shadowy face, the thing from the box still inside him, pulsing in and out of his reflection. He fell into prayer. He prayed for what seemed like the entire rest of the night, eventually falling asleep on the floor, and when he woke up, the thing was gone again. But he knew it wasn't gone for good. It had just retreated, retreated into hiding again. When would it return? This happened less than a year ago. AJ says that similar episodes have occurred since. And now AJ wonders if whatever he accidentally invited to attach to himself inside the devil's toy box will ever leave him alone for good. He wonders if one of these days when it returns, what if he doesn't have the strength to fight it? What happens if he ever gives in to its hunger? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a different story, huh? Do you want to get inside the devil's toy box? <sighs> I don't actually. When At first when you were explaining it, I was like, okay, okay, like this could be cool. This could be cool. Like I could do it. And then I was like, who am I kidding? I can't so do that. You're so just like the, all the reflect, like that fun house kind of That's mirror. what I was thinking of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Fun houses are creepy. Just oh, yeah, they are. Inherently mm -hmm. creepy with all those mirrors and just like. They just mess with your mind, seeing mm -hmm. yourself in all these angles and just not being able to tell like where like, you're looking at. And that mm -hmm. like, you and know. The, in depth, everything just is so off. It just, yeah, it truly messes with your brain. Don't like it. No pictures accompany this story. No. But uh, I, I did find some two cool and creepy, just like altered kind of mirror photos. Yeah. Looking for something. Oh, Isn't that creepy? That is creepy. Just that. Yeah. Oh, that looks like it's going to move. Mm hmm. Like it's coming out, the hand's coming out of I don't the like mirror. That. I don't like that. And then one more. 
Yeah, I just thought these were cool. Just like looking for something else. Is that a bat? No, but you can see her face in the top, in the middle. I know, and, I think it's a bat. And then the hands, huh? Yeah. Mm, I think it's the face of a bat. I'm sticking with bat. <laughs> I'm sticking can, with lady. No, because like, see, and then it's like, no, it's think. head's cocked and it's got like webby arms. Mm. Look at it. That's a person. I it's not think... a bat. It's a face. You can see her mouth, her nose, her eyes, her hair. I see a bat. F five fingers on the hand. I see a bat. The breast right in the middle. The breast in the middle. Thank you. Joe saw the breast. I think it's a bat with giant boobs. Okay. That's what I think. <laughs> it doesn't. Well, I think it's because the way that it like cracked like the nose or whatever. It just. Yeah. The crack mirror. Ah, yeah. 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 Yes. That, that sounds like a terrible idea. The mirror box ritual? Yeah. And there's smaller ones too for like those familiar with this stuff. Uh, I should I should say this. The devil's toy box is usually referred to a small box with mirrors lined inside. Like a box that you can't get in? Right. The box you, that I think like you put like charms or different like other rituals huh. where you're trying to um, basically like invite a entity inside of the box and then you open the box and whatever happens. I, I for sure, for yeah. sure do not want to invite any entities into my world. <laughs> right yeah like one don't want to chance it no no because it doesn't sound like uh it, it's not called like the angels toy box so <laughs> right so i sincerely doubt you're getting something good <laughs> yeah yeah i don't think it's intended yet to get something like friendly <sighs> for whatever reason even though i'm fascinated by these things and i'm interested in all that i would still not want to conjure something up that could potentially be harmful right it wouldn't it wouldn't be worth the knowledge of seeing nope, something nope 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 because, okay, I was thinking, as you were describing this, I was like, okay, if Dan went in the devil's toy box and I was the witness. <laughs> yeah. No, you'd be the, you'd be the, the, the or partner. The, the partner, yeah. whatever. The yeah. person on the outside. I was like, I could, I could handle that. And I was like, no way. No way. Because then you would want to kill me and it would be bad. <laughs> and I'd, I wouldn't know if I could believe you or not. And then. Well, that would uh, be the thing. If you really like get into this. Man. Is when the person comes back out and if you're like, uh, do you see anything? And they're like, no, I'm fine. But it says would, never believe. I know. I know. Would you trust them? It would just mess with your brain. I can't. Ugh. But if it was like someone we didn't really know and we lived in different states, <laughs> so they couldn't really, it would be really hard for them to come find me and eat me. How freaky would it be then if you just did it with some like random person somehow, you met some paranormal site, you know, across the states, and then like six months later you just you're in a coffee shop and you see oh them my God. just staring at you from across the room with like a weird look in their eye. That's like horror movie shit. <sighs> that actually Yeek. that would be a great horror movie. Mm -hmm. Got the chills. That's a great premise, actually. Oh boy. Oh we, buddy. We just tossed out a I know, screenplay. That's it. We just lost millions and millions uh, and millions money of dollars. Money gone. I know. Um but I I do think I would watch it like um, maybe if someone else was doing it, like someone else was the witness and someone else was the um, partner, mm -hmm. I would watch it like through FaceTime. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Like a very big distance. Now I'm thinking of another horror movie. You're watching it through FaceTime and then the person comes out and everything seems fine for a second and then the, the witness yeah. just really quick just reaches up and just snaps the person's <laughs> neck and then they just walk off frame. Well, there's another good movie Fucking idea gone. Second. That's a sequel. Man. God, we got, now we're, we're starting a whole franchise. You should calm down over there, Steven Spielberg. <laughs> uh, are you ready to move on to the uh, next story? I am. I am. I lost my pen during that story. So I, heard just, it, I heard something fall. Well, uh, it, yeah. I got excited and scared and all the things. I know. I got excited and I kind of fumbled. So I felt, yeah. But uh, yeah, I was, I was getting into that one. Uh, this next one is creepy, but far less, far less terrifying, in my opinion. Uh, not a supposedly true encounter. It's an old English ghost story written by a long dead author. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to yawn. Let's get into some Victorian era ghost fiction. Let's do it. Time now. And there, yeah, there's no setup. Just, oh, you know, okay. just telling the story. Time now for the tale of the ghost's summons. Wanted, sir, a patient. It was in the early days of my professional career when patients were scarce and fees scarcer. And though I was in the act of sitting down to my chop and had promised myself a glass of steaming punch afterwards, in honor of the Christmas season, I hurried instantly into my surgery. I entered briskly, but no sooner did I catch sight of the figure standing leaning against the counter than I started back with a strange feeling of horror, which for the life of me I could not comprehend. Never shall I forget the ghastliness of that face, the white horror stamped upon every feature, the agony which seemed to sink the very eyes beneath the contracted brows. It was awful to me to behold, accustomed as I was to scenes of terror. You seek advice, I began with some hesitation. No, I am not ill. You require then, hush, he interrupted, approaching more nearly and dropping his already low murmur to a mere whisper. I believe you are not rich. Would you be willing to earn a thousand pounds? 
A thousand pounds. His words seemed to burn my very ears. I should be thankful if I could do so honestly, I replied with dignity. What is the service required of me? A peculiar look of intense horror passed over the white face before me, but the blue-black lips answered firmly to attend a deathbed. A thousand pounds to attend a deathbed. Where am I to go then? Whose is it? Mine. The voice in which this was said sounded so hollow and distant that involuntarily I shrank back. Yours? What nonsense! You are not a dying man. You are pale, but you appear perfectly healthy. You- Hush! He interrupted. I know all this. You cannot be more convinced of my physical health than I am myself. Yet I know that before the clock tolls the first hour after midnight, I shall be a dead man. But he shuddered slightly, but stretching out his hand commandingly, motioned me to be silent. I am but too well informed of what I affirm, he said quietly. I have received a mysterious summons from the dead. No mortal aid can avail me. I am as doomed as the wretch on whom the judge has passed sentence. I do not come either to seek your advice or to argue the matter with you, but simply to buy your services. I offer you a thousand pounds to pass the night in my chamber and witness the scene which takes place. Some may appear to you extravagant, but I have no further need to count the cost of any gratification, and the spectacle you have to witness is no common sight of horror. The words, strange as they were, were spoken calmly enough, but as the last sentence dropped slowly from the livid lips, an expression of such wild horror again passed over the stranger's face, that in spite of the immense fee, I hesitated to answer. You fear to trust the promise of a dead man. See here and be convinced, he exclaimed eagerly. In the next instant on the counter between us lay a parchment document, and following the indication of that white muscular hand, I read the words... And to Mr. Frederick Keed of 14 High Street, Alton, I bequeath the sum of 1,000 pounds for certain services rendered to me. I have had that will drawn up within the last 24 hours, and I signed it an hour ago, in the presence of a competent witness. I am prepared, you see. Now do you accept my offer, or not? My answer was to walk across the room and take down my hat, and then lock the door of the surgery, communicating with the house. It was a dark, icy cold night, and somehow the courage and determination which the sight of my own name in connection with a thousand pounds had given me flagged considerably as I found myself hurried along to the silent darkness by a man whose deathbed I was about to attend. He was grimly silent, but as his hand touched mine, in spite of the frost, it felt like a burning coal. On we went, tramp, tramp through the snow, on, on, till even I grew weary, and at length on my appalled ear struck the chimes of a church clock. Whilst close at hand, I distinguished the snowy hillocks of a churchyard. Heavens! Was this awful scene of which I was to be the witness to take place veritably amongst the dead? Eleven! groaned the doomed man. Gracious God! But two hours more, and that ghostly messenger will bring the summons. Come, come! For mercy's sake, let us hasten! There was but a short road separating us now from a wall which surrounded a large mansion, and along this we hastened until we reached a small door. Passing through this, in a few minutes we were stealthily ascending the private staircase to a splendidly furnished apartment, which left no doubt of the wealth of its owner. All was intensely silent, however, through the house, and about this room in particular there was a stillness that, as I gazed around, struck me as almost ghastly. My companion glanced at the clock on the mantel shelf and sank into a large chair by the side of the fire with a shudder. Only an hour and a half longer, he muttered. Great heaven! I thought I had more fortitude. The horror unmans me. Then in a fiercer tone, tone and clutching my arm, he added, Ha! You mock me! You think me mad! But wait till you see! Wait till you see! I put my hand on his wrist, for there was now a fever in his sunken eyes, which checked the superstitious chill which had been gathering over me and made me hope that, after all, my first suspicion was correct and that my patient was but the victim of some fearful hallucination. Mock you! I answered soothingly, far from it. I sympathize intensely with you and would do much aid you. You require sleep. Lie down and leave me to watch. He groaned, but rose and began throwing off his clothes and watching my opportunity, I slipped a sleeping powder, which I had managed to put in my pocket before leaving the surgery, into the tumbler of claret that stood beside him. The more I saw, the more I felt convinced that it was the nervous system of my patient which required my attention, and it was with sincere satisfaction I saw him drink the wine and then stretch himself on the luxurious bed. Ha, thought I, as the clock struck twelve, and instead of a groan, the deep breathing of the sleeper sounded through the room. You won't receive any summons tonight, and I may make myself comfortable. 
Noiselessly, therefore, I replenished the fire, poured myself out a large glass of wine, and drawing the curtain so that the firelight should not disturb the sleeper, I put myself in a position to follow his example. How long I slept I know not, but suddenly I roused with a start and a ghostly a thrill of horror as ever I remember to have felt in my life. Something, what I knew not, seemed near, something nameless, but unutterably awful. I gazed round. The fire emitted a faint blue glow, just sufficient to enable me to see that the room was exactly the same as when I fell asleep, but that the long hand of the clock wanted but five minutes of the mysterious hour, which was to be the death moment of the summoned man. Was there anything in it then? Any truth in the strange story he had told? The silence was intense. I could not even hear a breath from the bed, and I was about to rise and approach when again that awful horror seized me. And at that same moment, my eye fell upon the mirror opposite the door, and I saw, great heaven, that awful shape, that ghastly mockery of what had been humanity. Was it really a messenger from the buried, quiet dead? It stood there in visible death clothes, but the awful face was ghastly with corruption, and the sunken eyes gleamed forth a green glassy glare which seemed a veritable blast from the infernal fires below. To move or utter a sound in that hideous presence was impossible. And like a statue, I sat and saw the horrid shape move slowly towards the bed. What was the awful scene enacted there, I know not. I heard nothing, except a low, stifled, agonized groan. And I saw the shadow of the ghastly messenger bending over the bed. Whether it was some dreadful but wordless sentence its breathless lips conveyed as it stood there, I know not. But for an instant, the shadow of a claw-like hand, from which the third finger was missing, oh. appeared extended over the doomed man's head. And then, as the clock struck one clear, silvery stroke, it fell, and a wild shriek rang through the room, a death shriek. I am not given to fainting, but I certainly confess that the next ten minutes of my existence was a cold blank. And even when I did manage to stagger to my feet, I gazed round, vainly endeavoring to understand the chilly horror which still possessed me. Thank God the room was rid of the awful presence. I saw that. So, gulping down some wine... I lighted a wax taper and staggered towards the bed. Ah, oh, how I prayed that, after all, I might have been dreaming, and that my own excited imagination had but conjured up some hideous memory of the dissecting room. But one glance was sufficient to answer that. No, the summons had indeed been given and answered. I flashed a light over the dead face, swollen, convulsed, still with death, agony, but suddenly I shrank back. Even as I gazed, the expression of the face seemed to change. The blackness faded into a deathly whiteness. The convulsed features relaxed, and even as if the victim of that dread apparition still lived, a sad, solemn smile stole over the pale lips. I was intensely horrified, but still I retained sufficient self-consciousness to be struck professionally by such phenomenon. Surely there was something more than supernatural agency in all this. Again I scrutinized the dead face, and even the throat and chest, but with the exception of a tiny pimple on one temple beneath a cluster of hair, not a mark appeared. To look at the corpse, one would have believed that this man had indeed died by the visitation of God, peacefully, while sleeping. How long I stood there I know not, but time enough to gather my scattered senses and to reflect that, all things considered, my own position would be very unpleasant if I was found thus unexpectedly in the room of a mysteriously dead man. So as noiselessly as I could, I made my way out of the house. No one met me on the private staircase. The little door opening into the road was easily unfastened. And thankful indeed was I to feel again the flesh, the fresh, wintry air as I hurried along that road by the churchyard. There was a magnificent funeral soon in that church, and it was said that the young widow of the buried man was inconsolable. And then rumors got abroad of a horrible apparition which had been seen on the night of the death, and it was whispered the young widow was terrified and huh. insisted upon leaving her splendid mansion. I was too mystified with the whole affair to risk my reputation by saying what I knew and I should have allowed my share in it to remain forever buried in oblivion had I not suddenly heard that the widow, objecting to many of the legacies in the last will of her husband, intended to dispute it on the score of insanity, and then there gradually arose the rumor of his belief in having received a mysterious summons. On this I went to the lawyer and sent a message to the lady that as the last person who had attended her husband, I undertook to prove his sanity, and I besought her to grant me an interview in which I would relate as strange and horrible a story as ear had ever heard. The same evening, I received an invitation to go to the mansion. I was ushered immediately into a splendid room, and there, standing before the fire, 
was the most dazzlingly beautiful young creature I had ever seen. She was very small, but exquisitely made. Had it not been for the dignity of her carriage, I should have believed her a mere child. With a stately bow, she advanced, but did not speak. I come on a strange and painful errand, I began, and then I started, for as I happened to glance full into her eyes, and from them down to the small right hand grasping the chair, the wedding ring was on that hand. I conclude you are the Mr. Keed who requested permission to tell me some absurd ghost story, and whom my late husband mentions here. And as she spoke, she stretched out her left hand towards something, but what I knew not, for my eyes were fixed on that hand. Horror. White and delicate it might be, but it was shaped like a claw, and the third finger was missing. Oh my God. One sentence was enough after that. Madam, all I can tell you is that the ghost who summoned your husband was marked by a singular deformity. The third finger of the left hand was missing, I said sternly, and the next instant I had left that beautiful sinful presence. The will was never disputed. The next morning I received a check for a thousand pounds, and the next news I heard of the widow was that she had herself seen the awful apparition and had left the mansion immediately. Weird. Right? It's a weird, creepy story. Was it her? I know. I have a couple questions. I want to show you the pictures. Okay. And then I've read that story four or five times now. I was like, did I miss something? Did I I confuse myself? So here's the only illustration I can find that seems to be associated with the book. Okay. Uh, just a little apparition over the over the guy there. Um, I'm not for sure that it's part of that. It didn't say, but it just kept showing up in searches. Uh-huh. And then and then this is just some creepy photo based on old Victorian ghost photos when people like that is fucking creepy. Uh huh. Oh, I don't like that. Super creepy. And then super. Now I think that's a modern uh, kind of like a homage to that. Here's an yeah. old actual Victorian uh, ghost photo. People love to take these. What is it? Double exposure. Or something, and like it's like it's like old it's like old Photoshop. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Now the questions I had, I mean, also, and I kept, I read this, reread it, reread it, reread it. Yeah. <laughs> like, are the widow and the ghost the same person? That's what I wanted to know. Is she already dead? Is she, exactly? Is she dead somehow? And then she came back for him. Right. But then how did? But then, then why but would then she, she was, contest the will? But then she was at the funeral, like mm-hmm. unconsolable. So like she would have, even if she was a spirit, she was right. seen by so many people. Right. It's just weird that whole hand detail. And at I first, know. I was like, oh, well, then she must have poisoned him or killed him by like by regular human means. Yeah. But then it's like, how would he know that he was going to die at exactly one a.m.? Okay, she could have dressed up. I thought like maybe he's a ghost and like you know snuck in on him. But then when the doctor saw her, he he described an awful face, ghastly with corruption. Mm-hmm. Like he, it, it seemed as if he saw something that wasn't human. Yeah. So that's an odd detail. It's not like they had great uh, uh, special effects makeup, you know. <laughs> true. True. Uh, back then, so I was thinking about no, like, that. No like GoPros, no sneaky little ways right. to kind of trick you. And even if she did. How would she be able to make him die without, like, running an axe into his head or something? Right, and without doing exactly, anything. Yeah, exactly. It's just at a hand. O'clock. So then it's like, is this some kind of story about, you know, back then they believed that certain people could place curses. Maybe. More like witches. Is she supposed to be some, like a witch of some kind? It never, it just leaves you to wonder. So I wonder, Creeps, Peepers, uh, Roberts, Annabelle's, let us know. Let us know, uh, you know, via email, socials, uh, YouTube comments. What do you Whatever. think this story yeah, is that's about? That's weird. Because I cannot figure it out. I, I tried to find some kind of interpretation online. Yeah. It's not a very well-known story. So there, are, to my knowledge, is no interpretations of what the story is supposed to be about out there on the web. Huh. Um, it's kind of a forgotten uh, Victorian ghost story. But I but I, but I, I liked it. it I it, like it. It was it, just odd. It's just odd. Yeah. Yee, yee, yee. <laughs> I know, because at the end, I was like, where is he going? Like, mm-hmm. who cares? Okay. And I thought, like, right. oh, he's just going to collect his money. Like, whatever. Do we even need that detail? But then right. the hand thing. Right. I know. And that's, yeah, it obviously. Weird. Obviously, there's a connection. Right, right. Obviously, but, it's the yeah. same entity. But then but then what is it? is it? Is it a widow pretending to be a ghost or a ghost pretending to be a living widow? Okay, and tell or something me, else I'm missing. And then tell me, okay, the person who wrote it, it's, yeah. a, it's not supposed to be like a first-hand account, right? It's supposed to be. No, 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 no. This is fiction. Okay. Yeah, this is like, hmm. uh, this is that, um, the the tradition of Victorian writers and then writers, you know, going on into the early 20th century uh, in the UK. Yeah. Th- that just, because a lot of, like, it was a kind of tradition thing where even if the author wasn't, um, primarily a horror-based author. It was just something they would do Yeah, like something the that they would submit to like, you know, magazines and, mm-hmm. and, and different things, little uh, compilations yeah. for these kind of, you know, Christmas 
uh, ghost stories. The one we're telling in the December uh, Patreon bonus episode, I'm doing one author, two stories. Yeah. And now, I feel bad. Now I'm blanking on his name. But he was um, he was a guy who was really well known for like romance novels. Oh. Uh, well, I it, guess they kind of have like the same yeah. elements. While he was alive, he was known for that. Um, he was based primarily in Italy. But then in death, uh, what's been remembered are his ghost stories. Like Funny. He, he just wrote a few. And they're like the, the lasting... The ones that have kind of held the test of time. Yeah, yeah, interesting, yeah. interesting, Dan. Thank you. Wow. Do you? What kind of squishy do you want to use this uh, week? I'll use. There's Layla. like a crystal right there if you want a crystal. No, I'm, I'm good. I like Layla. Did oh, you guys? I got a Christmas present in the mail yesterday, and Dan, he has feelings about it. <laughs> I got... I'm, I'm I'm over all the now because I know that you're not going to go too much further into the whole crystal territory. It's our, funny you say that, but then I keep inching along. Uh, our, I, I think I've learned to not be overt with it. I've placed yeah. crystals in our house that you don't even know about. Oh boy. Our yeah. new our new sister in law. Yes. Uh yeah, you're in your one of your new BFFs. Beth BFF. Mm-hmm. Emily, she uh she sent you it's, a care package full of crystals and then some kind of I don't know. I well it's new to me, so I'm excited to learn about it. Yeah. I mean I've heard of it. Um it's cr- uh, a crystal grid. Like a, it's yeah. a cloth piece of fabric and it has this sort of like black design through it. It reminds me of something, but I, I can't. How funny would it be if you're fucking around with that kind of stuff does accidentally like bring something to attach to you? No, that's not how crystals work. You don't know that. I do actually. Maybe that's what they want you to believe. And then you're the one telling, how funny would it be if okay, you're, okay, if you're okay, the one up. telling me, don't should, do these I, rituals, no, don't do these no, rituals. No. Meanwhile, then you're like, but, Where's but the honestly, stories? but I Where's have a crystal stories? grid. Where's the stories? I'll find one. Somebody playing with crystals brings the spirit in. I want that story next week. Find you're, it. You're going to be that story. Oh, man. I doubt it. <laughs> because ever since I brought crystals into our home, the activity mm-hmm. died down. This is going to be the third movie in, our, in the trilogy <laughs> that we started t- today on the show. Yes, James Wan. <laughs> this is going to be, yeah, now it's going to be, you know, you don't, it's like the two, it starts with the mirror box uh-huh. and it goes to more mirror stuff and then it moves into like crystals and then crystals have reflective properties and send uh-huh. it, so you actually inadvertently build a more powerful devil's toy box. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. then for the tri- for the third one, you bring in the real devil. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. What you don't know is that right now this is a movie. The Maybe. movie, the we're movie all, is we're all like. inside a simulation. Well, the movie is like couple starts podcast about horror. Wife gets into crystals. Husband is like, eh, wife really believes. Uh-huh. And meanwhile, husband doesn't know she's doing occult things behind his back Ooh. and really trying to like, you know, mm-hmm. have have the, the demons get him. What if there's a twist? So, so pretty soon hey. you're going to be like fucked up. What if there's a cool twist in that movie you just, you just thought up where then it's like you're- I didn't just think it the, up. You're in it. I know. Okay. Okay. The cool okay. movie is real. Then you're doing the cool stuff and then you're like, ah, oh, now we're going to get him. And then you like sneak me out to the woods. Oh yeah. And then once uh-huh. you get there, you find out I'm the fucking leader of the cult that you're a part of and you get killed. Well, no one dies. They do in my movie. Oh. You just got thrown in a pit. Aggressive. You well, just got, <laughs> you got thrown on a pyre, of, a burning pyre of wood. No. And then you got sacrificed to bring the demon into the world. Our My movie was mm-hmm. supposed to come to a head when you were going to do your big hike to the top of a mountain. Mm. Something was going to come down and show itself to you. But then... In my movie... You had to go and get COVID and not go on the <laughs> hike. So now I have to come up with a different climax. In my movie, when I go to the top of the mountain, I do get something and I bring it back and I throw it on you. Oh. Mm-hmm. Okay. We have a, <laughs> Is it like chicken fingers? I don't even, <laughs> maybe. Oh my God. That's a whole other story. <laughs> okay. Would you like Would you like some spoopy stories? I do. Okay. So who, who's hanging out with you today, Layla? Layla. Layla. Are you going to sing Layla's song? Layla. Oh, that is not what I was thinking. You got me on my knees, Layla. Okay. You started a little off key. So I know. That, I, know. I was, I I was like, that, that was the song. I have committed. <laughs> that was the I song I was, I was thinking, and I was like, what is going on? Okay. <laughs> well, we just, I thought we needed a I, little break. I wasn't expecting to break into Clapton. <laughs> You, I mean, should, you should always be ready to break into Clapton <laughs> or or Phil Collins. Those are your options. Phil Collins? What are you talking about? Phil Collins has to have a song called Layla? I know. I said you should always be ready to break into. Oh, that was a random second option. Because it's a really good one because everybody knows the Phil Collins song. <laughs> this show's really gotten off the rails. <laughs> I'm really tired. Okay. I'm trying All right, here. Phil Collins. I love Phil Collins. Do you know that? Mm-hmm. You know. You actually do know that. I really I love do. him. And Paul Simon. Okay. Ready, ready? There's, there's something in the air tonight, and it's supposed to be your fucking <laughs> stories you're supposed to tell. <laughs> <laughs> Fine, whatever. Okay. Okay, here we go. Um, so now, it's been a little while um, since we had a military-based story. It felt yeah. like for a while, actually, we were getting, like, remember when we had that lady who um, was, like, she is in a bunker, basically? Like, uh, 
she go. <sighs> wow. Oh yes, I, I do don't know remember. How to yes, it. I yeah. do. I do. I do. Some sort of like mm-hmm. intelligence mm-hmm. kind of. It was like a missile silo. It was like Thank an abandoned, like, mm-hmm. like yeah. an old missile silo. There was a, just a, a a two people down in great there. Memory. Yep. Yes. Yeah. So we had that, and then we had haunted barracks. You know, yep. maybe in a Hawaii. while ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've had some Hawaii like people living over in Pearl Harbor. There's just been like a variety yeah. of things. So for a while, I was kind of like, okay, you know. Like, I, I believe them, but maybe, maybe sure. not. This story, I'm, I'm not saying that I don't believe them. I'm not saying that theirs aren't true. I just think that, you know, sometimes like when you're in like a stressed situation, yeah. you, because all of those situations are like middle of a night shift, it's long, yeah. you're probably away from your family. I was like, okay, there's an element of it that I could disregard that okay. makes me like, eh, this, I'm like, okay. okay. I, I feel like this is as much proof that you could get. Ready, ready? Yep. All right. Hey there. I'm a huge fan of both Time Suck and Scared to Death. Thank you. I love hearing Lindsay getting a little revenge on Dan during her stories. So here's my attempt to get him as well. I'm keeping out specific names so as to not unintentionally violate OSPEC. Oh. Okay. 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 I deployed to Iraq in 2018 and was there through the beginning of 2019. I am a combat, combat medic. And at 21 years old, found myself responsible for 30 guys in my platoon, a mix of scouts and infantry. We spent most of our time on Q West, a small air air base outside of Mosul. However, we also operated in Erbil and the Syrian border. With all of the places and all of the things I saw during my time there, by far the scariest moment of the nine-month tour involved a supernatural being. This event happened only a couple months after arriving in Iraq. Myself and my best friend, who I did almost everything with, Specialist P, were sitting in an MRAP, basically a big-ass truck with a 50 caliber machine gun on top. We were sitting out there late one night, defending the open side of an airfield, the other side of which led to the forward operating base. For miles in front of us, all we could see was the open desert and the distant lights of a small community about six kilometers away from us. It was sometime after midnight. And there was a decently bright moon out giving Specialist P, who was on the 50 cal, a clear sight line far into the distance. I was sitting in the driver's seat of the MRAP since it was equipped with a DVE, a thermal imaging system, and I needed to keep an eye on it. Specialist P and I were several hours into our 12-hour shift. Even at night, it was still close to 100 degrees, and we were both sweltering in our kit. We talked about how bad the local cigarettes were and what kind of food we would get if we could have just about anything. All of a sudden, about 50 meters in front of the truck, I saw what looked like a thin adult male running from left to right at an, at an incredible speed. Not superhuman speed, but definitely faster paced than someone should be able to run in that kind of heat. In his hands, I could clearly make out a rifle with the distinctive curve of a magazine belonging to an AK-47. I screamed to Specialist P, contact 50 meters, he has a weapon running left to right. I hear him charge the 50 cal and shuffle around, trying to find the man without overexposing himself. I sat and waited to hear either the booming of the 50 cal or the crack of a 763 round flying either past or into the front of the truck. I followed the man with the camera. It seemed like seconds, but also it felt like an eternity at the same time. This would be both mine and Specialist P's first time to engage with the enemy. Then, in a panicked voice, I hear Specialist P, Doc, where is he? I don't see him anywhere. With his head and part of his chest exposed, he knows how dangerous it is and it is to, how dangerous it is to not know exactly where a bullet may come from. He's at the one o'clock, still running full speed. I screamed back, scared for my friend. Where? Where? He screams back. I cannot find him. Knowing that Specialist P can do nothing if he can't find the target, I charge my M4 and turn on the PEC, an infrared laser mounted to the barrel used to shoot at night, and I switch on my nods. I look back to study the DVE one last time. The man is no longer running. He has stopped at the truck's three o'clock and is facing us, his rifle held by his waist but pointed directly at us. I throw open the door. I throw open the door and I... Oh my God, I'm so sorry. I throw open the door of the MRAP and stand on the support step so I can see over the truck to exactly where the man was standing. I shoulder my rifle, switch from sage to semi, and look to the exact spot where I had seen the man on the DVE. There's nothing there. Absolutely nothing. No one. I start to quickly look around and around the area just to be sure he hadn't moved in what must have been half a second while I was moving out of the truck, but still nothing. I knew he was there in an open field with no real grass to lie down on and hide. I knew I should be seeing him. 
I shout to Specialist P, duck down. I think I lost him. I see him slide most of the way into the hatch, leaving only his face exposed. I get back in myself and start scanning with the DVE, which can swivel 180 degrees from 3 to 9 o'clock while also tilting up and down. There was nothing. I could see every place this thing could have possibly gone, and there was still nothing. I, sell, I tell Specialist P, he's gone, man. Huh. I hear him let out a huge breath. I radioed to HQ that I saw someone with a rifle moving through the field and told them the direction. Roger was all I heard back. Specialist P and I now sat in total silence. The only noise to be heard was the camera of the DVE rotating back and forth as it scanned the area. Looking at the screen, I realized something. The figure I saw was lit up white. This would have been normal for looking at a body on DVE's de default settings where cold things turn black and hot things turn white. However, out of pure boredom, I had switched the settings earlier in the night so that black was now hot and white was now cold. Meaning, this thing didn't have a temperature a human would. It didn't even have a temperature close to the environment around it. It was Weird. cold and not just chilly, but cold enough to light up a Christmas tree on the DVE's current setting. Specialist P and I were relieved at about noon. We sat outside the tent smoking cigarettes, drinking water for a couple hours, and not saying much at all. Eventually, we went into the tent and went to sleep. Months later, Specialist P and I were walking with the interpreter one night on a roaming guard shift. Specialist P and the Terp were doing most of the talking. I can't remember how because I was only half listening, but the conversation turned to the supernatural. Suddenly, something caught my ear. I heard the Terp say something about the boy in the airfield. I asked him what he had just said. He replied almost jov jovially. P and I were just talking about ghosts. He went on to explain that the U.S. built Q West and then pulled out before coming back and bombing most of the now ISIS-held airfield and base so that we could reestablish in order to take Mosul. Several ISIS members had died in the bombing and the artillery missile strikes. This included several older teenage fighters. Allegedly, one of these fighters still roams the airfield. Whether he's sprinting away from the explosions from long ago still looking for one of his Western enemies, or is simply lost, no one knows. However, upon hearing this corroboration from the Terp, I began to ask around. Almost every local that spoke English seemed to know about him. Several soldiers I talked to were also aware of him, and not just American soldiers, Iraqis, Australian, Finnish, and Canadian soldiers as well had seen him. Weird. Whoever or whatever he was, I know I will never forget my run-in with the only enemy I had no idea how to kill. The boy in the airfield. That's a super cool, Isn't that bizarre, just bizarre. But like, yeah, that that whole th yeah, that, that gave me the chills. I uh, know that whole. Th uh, yeah, I just never thought of. I don't know that. That's an interesting like um, apparition tale where you know you, you we hear so many stories. There are so many stories about like you know footsteps in the attic, right? You know the apparition in the hallway, something walking in the house, like a previous owner of the home, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And, and I didn't think about like a war zone, right? It makes total sense right people are dying in this space i mean i guess the closest thing i can think of to that is like uh, uh people who see or claim to see the apparitions of uh civil, civil war, war. Sol yeah, soldiers like gettysburg too. places mm -hmm. like that but i just never thought of it for whatever reason in like a more modern kind of sense right and like of course it exists i mean if it exists if we are going down that yeah. that train of thought then of course they're there yeah yeah that 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 uh the equipment he had. The DVE. Yeah, the DVE, the registered like heat, uh -huh. like infrared. Is that called infrared? I don't know. It, it is. I think it so, is. right? Okay, yeah. Okay, it's yeah. Like, but yeah, that, that would normally like pick up a body. I, I think so, right? Infrared is like what picks it up. Yeah. If, if not. Radar, I, whatever. Yeah, if they, not, you know, you know what, what I'm saying. saying. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Where uh, that's crazy that it would, that, it would, that he could visually see this humanoid apparition mm -hmm. with the shadow of an AK-47. I know. And then the equipment is registering absolutely no temperature. Right, right. And what? Well, a cold temperature. A cold temperature. Uh, it's, it's registering Which, the absolute wrong kind of temperature. Right. And I thought it was crazy that he, I fumbled a little bit when I was telling the story, but he's saying that, you know, he sees it on this DVE. Yeah. And his partner cannot find it. So it's, it's only visible on the device. And then even uh, the storyteller pops yeah. his head out or actually moves his whole body outside of the truck because, you know, they have to work in tandem, right? I yeah. mean, this is my limited military experience, <laughs> but or knowledge, yeah, yeah, yeah. knowledge. Uh, no, it's my experience, Dan. <laughs> uh, but you know, so he pops out, and he's the the um, the medic is you know armed and is yeah. ready to shoot this thing. But 
from the the three seconds from here to here, from looking at it to stepping out of the truck, yeah. he also can't find it. So it's just so insane to me. It only shows up on the DVE. That's the only way it can be seen. If they didn't have that piece of equipment, he would have never seen it. Yeah, that is so weird. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, and then, of course, you know, the confirmation at the end from yeah. people from all different types of, you know, countries, different soldiers and locals saying yeah. like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, we've seen it too. Yeah, and I love that confirmation actually from the various... Uh, cultures because Mm -hmm. I think every culture has its own set of beliefs. Yeah. So it's, you know, some cultures really embrace it. Others really kind of push it away. And for various people to see it. Did he say Finnish too, right? He said Finnish. Yeah, he said Iraqis, Australian, Finnish, Finnish. and Canadian soldiers. I I don't know why Finnish surprised me. I'm like, why are there Finnish soldiers there? Because they seem so practical. Yeah, I I don't know why I wouldn't think that they would be in that conflict too. Yeah. Right. Well, well, I think, I mean... We could explore that topic, but I just think that like when that is not your world, yeah, you know, you just you just don't know. Yeah, you just take it for granted. They're like, I don't know, they're doing what they do, right? You right. know, yeah. Um, okay, so now I have a very little short okay. baby story, um, but it was like too good not to tell. So we are headed down to Texas for a little quick hitter, totally short and not at all sweet story here. Hello, scared to death crew. I love the show. My girlfriend introduced me to it, and we've been binge listening ever since. I wanted to tell you my personal experience. It only happened once, but I'll never forget it. I used to live in a mobile home lot in the outskirts of Atticosa County, Texas. The lot used to be a large peach orchard that was then converted to lots after the original owner passed away. One night, I had woken up in my bedroom from a dream I just couldn't remember. Everything seemed normal until I noticed that my TV was on. There was no show on or anything actually playing at all, only a soft light on a dark screen. I wanted to get up to make sure that it was off, but then I noticed I could not move. I was paralyzed, only able to move my eyes. I noticed something pale from the corner of my eye. When I looked, terror washed over me. I saw a woman lying in bed next to me, smiling. She had paper white skin with black eyes, teeth, and lips. She arose from her side of my bed, not breaking eye contact with me, still smiling. I got a better look at her, even though I wanted to shut my eyes, I couldn't. She was a young woman, probably in her late 20s, wearing a white Victorian-style nightgown. Her mouth was oozing what looked like black blood. She also had streaks coming from her eyes, as if she were crying black tears. I couldn't think. I couldn't move. My only focus was this white figure staring at me, as if it were looking into my soul. She walked backwards, away from my bed, without breaking composure, without breaking her stare. Not a word was said. After that... My mind went blank and I passed out from fear. She never showed herself again and everything was fine for as long as I lived there after this. However, about a week later, I noticed some bruises on my arms and legs. I have big dogs that I would like to rough play with and so I just paid no mind to it, thinking it was from that. That was until my mother took a closer look. The bruises were in the shape of a human bite, teeth marks and all. We moved a couple of years later and it's been a decade since that incident, but I haven't ever been able to forget her face your fellow creep b uh b yeah that that one it's like my, my brain my brain was going to to like sleep paralysis like night oh, terrors sure. i was like okay she had a really bad nightmare and, uh-huh. and it's like and she's seeing this thing that i can totally picture uh-huh because, because it is like for whatever reason like horror movies and stuff like like the 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 dark you know the the makeup like, running down yeah, like the, the, the grudge yes exactly, yeah. exactly exactly but then the bite i know and you and and a dog bite and a human bite are obviously very different markings completely very different, different mouth shape yeah you know like uh yeah, a dog like the the way the teeth are curved, obviously because the snout like so much more thin. Mm-hmm. There's, I don't think there's any way you would ever mistake the two. No. So if you're thinking like that's a human bite, and you mm-hmm. and you would also remember if like oh yeah my, my boy, dog bit me my boyfriend bit me like, my, like oh yeah 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 you know like you would you would that wouldn't be something you just be like for, you would completely forget. <laughs> true. <laughs> Hard true. enough to leave marks. Yeah, isn't that weird? That's super weird. Yeah, I just like that it was just a little mm-hmm. ye. Um, and then I just have one more for you. Okay. Just a, a, a quick little tale, uh, just to get you in the Christmas spirit. Yeah. It's it's not traditional in any sense, but it is one fucking spoopy story. Okay. Okay. Happy holidays, Lindsay and Dan. This is something that happened to me and my family about 15 years ago, and to this day, I am affected by it every day, and you'll soon understand why. I was in high school at the time. My family, which consisted of my mom, my dad, and my younger brother, and I, we had just moved into a new house. Everything was fine and normal for a couple months, but just like any cliche story, weird stuff started happening. 
We started to hear things, things would go missing, or things would get moved. When it came to things going missing, my parents started accusing my brother and I. We became resentful of our new house. It felt like there it felt like we were always being watched and it was rather exhausting. My brother was the first one to suggest that there was a ghost in the house. I, of course, didn't believe it at all, but I started to feel like he was right as the moments, weeks, and days were going by. The climax of this story takes place on Christmas Eve. For Cuban Americans, we start our celebrations on Christmas Eve. We have all of our families together and party into the night until midnight of Christmas Day. This was our first Noche Buena, Christmas Eve, in the new house, but we agreed to go to my aunt's house three houses down the street. At some point in the night, the cousins and I decided to play hide and seek. The parameters were between my aunt's house and my house. I, of course, wanted to play and hide in my house because I am an intense hide and seek player. <laughs> but anyways, that's besides the point. I snuck in through my sliding glass door and hunkered down in the cabinet between the sink and the fridge. As I waited for my cousin to find me, I heard footsteps. I was thinking it was her. I cracked open the cabinet to see. And to my horror, it was not my cousin. For a second, I thought that my little uh. brother, I thought about what my little brother had said and thought it was a ghost but can't be. I clearly see a person shuffling around the kitchen. He opened the fridge door so the light let me see this person a little bit better. He was an average height and a lanky man. Scruffy face, long hair. He literally just grabbed some food from the fridge and walked back into the hallway behind the kitchen. As soon as I thought the coast was clear, I bolted out of my house and ran to my parents. I was shaking and crying. I was barely making sense, but I was able to get out what I saw. My parents didn't believe me. They just thought I saw things because it was dark mixed with the past few months of paranoia. I eventually convinced them to at least install cameras throughout the house, but it had to be done discreetly. Not a, not a week went by and we caught something on film. The person literally came out of the ceiling what? and just grabbed some food from our fridge to eat. It seemed like a person was living there. The <sighs> The police came and found him in the ceiling. Oh, my God. Just as we saw in the video. Apparently, he had been living there coincidentally around the time we moved in. How did this person go unnoticed for months? Did he see or hear anything? <laughs> my sense of privacy has been shattered since that day. Oh my God. I live with my husband now in a different city uh... since that incident, but I still routinely check my ceilings and have cameras <sighs> set up in certain spots of the house. I bet. I am suspicious of every sound I hear or anything misplaced. Every Christmas Eve is a bit stressful. It's funny. I almost rather my what? brother would have been right about it being ghosts. That would have been less traumatic in my opinion. <sighs> Every story I see that comes out about an uninvited person living in an unsuspecting family's house is triggering for me. I recommend checking your crawl spaces and attics from here on out. <laughs> Anyways, thanks for listening to my story. I love the podcast and Time Suck. Thanks for making my commute less uneventful. Thank you, Maddie from Orlando. Hashtag Creeper. Thanks, Maddie. Uh, that was a great twist. I know. I know. And that. And that <laughs> Can you fucking imagine? No. That, and, and that's like, um, <laughs> like just out of the <laughs> fucking ceiling. You just <laughs> that's almost more terrifying. <laughs> it is. Cause I, I, that's that's a uh, I mean darkly funny. But I just picture like <laughs> yeah. I just picture like this family like a, like again we're going with a movie theme today. Another movie where you're like you know you think there's ghosts like no I swear to God I hear footsteps and other people don't hear them and you're going out of your mind you're like I swear to God there's a ghost in our attic and then you find there's a fucking dude who's just been living there for God knows how long. You're crushing it, James Cameron. You got all these movies. What are you doing here in Coeur d'Alene? <laughs> Get to Hollywood. <laughs> I yeah, I have this. I have like every other asshole. I have like, oh, this would be a great mm, movie idea. So I'm, I'm sure screenwriters love that guy. Oh, you know, you should write about. Like, it, do you think that's the same person who's like who tells you that you can use their material on stage? Oh, for that's sure, the for equivalent. sure, for sure. And, you, you can and, use this. Yeah, and I wouldn't. And I wouldn't do that if there was an actual screenwriter here. I wouldn't be like doing serious pitches. <laughs> I would be like, hey, now, okay, we'll work out a deal for the trilogy I talked about earlier. Now, for this next movie, you can just have it. Just use it. Just here you go. It's, it's, it's I know it's, it's going to be great. You're going to make millions. Come on, Attic, you got it. <laughs> Real dude. <laughs> but isn't that fucking yeah. creepy? That is really creepy. And now, for sure, I will be checking all crawl spaces in all future houses. <laughs> I know that our crawl space is okay because, A, from the. What, what I don't understand is how did they get through the inspection phase of the house? Yeah. Because when you buy a house, uh, yeah. you maybe make, he wasn't there. I don't, I don't know. know. I don't know. Maybe somebody. Well, the. Insp I mean, if That's I was so fucking if I was, weird, if that happened in our house. 
I would be going back to the inspection company and being like, uh, uh, hey, hey, I'm, I'm going to fucking sue the shit out of you. And <laughs> you I'm not a litigious something. person, but uh, you missed this guy living you up missed, here. You missed Larry. <laughs> You you found the poor electrical wiring. <laughs> you noticed there was a crack in our foundation. You missed fucking Larry. Larry was more important than the crack <laughs> right, in the foundation. Right. It makes me think uh, about when we lived in LA yeah. uh, and things would go missing in our apartment, like like food or whatever. I'd be like, oh, I guess the hobo ate it again. And we would joke about it, but it's like. <laughs> but that's a real. That oh my God. I didn't. I'd never heard a story like this. No, I'm uh, exponentially. I, I have seen weird news stories. You have? Usually, I feel like it's usually like a store or something where somebody's hiding out. Oh, yeah. And then after hours, they sneak down and like, you know, get some stuff and go back to their hiding place. But I have heard, I, I want to say it was in Japan or somewhere where like there, there was like just some lady oh. who was just like living in like a weird in-between spot in the house, like in the house, like like a tiny like walk-in closet sized space that was in between some rooms. Yeah. And she would just like pop out. From the ceiling, or that sounds like, familiar. I feel like above the fridge, maybe in my mind, I'm seeing, but but it, there has been other cases of this, which is it's just it's all so bizarre. So bizarre, a great practical <laughs> joke. Well, that's what I was thinking too. I was like, after talking about this, how would it great to be to hire some dude? To, yeah, to like be up in the attic, and then I pretend that I don't hear the steps, <laughs> and I'm like, all right, fine, we'll go look. <laughs> <laughs> and then we go toward the little crawl space opening, just have him pop like, <laughs> ah! just oh, just get so the good. shit out of you. Oh my god, we so, don't have the right kind of crawl space to do that. It'd be hard. It'd be they couldn't walk. They'd have to. Well, no, and like because like where it too is too small. Like there's, I was just thinking about the house that I grew up in as a kid. Our attic slash crawl space when you would go down we lived in a uh, ranch on a basement when you would go down the hallway if you looked up there was like a very large door and you would pull the string and then steps would come down oh, and you could, oh yeah yeah, like, yeah we, we don't, don't have that we don't have anything like that we have a small square Little in a hole. hallway yeah yeah and then you go up to a small space which is like very difficult i think we should pay some guy to be up there and then oh we God. don't hear about it, but for the kids oh because you know that crawl space is right over Kyler's right over the room. right over oh, the room God. and then we take it real far and then we have that person like come out of the ceiling at night and just beat the shit out of both of them oh. go back in there and then we pretend that that didn't happen either <laughs> and we <laughs> and we just let it go for like a week or so as always taking it too far okay okay do you want to do some um, shout outs? I do. Okay. I do. You can go first. I want to thank some Annabelles for supporting our show. Well, that's nice. Yes. Uh, I want to, th uh, and thanks for, for watching the uh, This Looks Awesome movie club. Oh, yeah. I hope uh, you guys are loving it. Episodes as well. I did not watch The Wretched with the boys. I was supposed to. Mm -hmm. And then. Uh, you wanted some, I don't remember. You I were think, doing something. You I think I something. just like needed a break from you. <laughs> I think so. Uh, I want to thank uh, Alduin's Doom, uh, Lauren Carlisle, Bree Danielle. Andy Rue, who just stopped by, a oh, local. Oh, Andy uh, Rue, yeah. long time. Mm -hmm, long time fan. Uh, Julia Lindquist, Malia Love, Garrett Gerling, Steve DeMarco, Carla, no last name, and Serena D. Good job. Thank you. I, I would like to thank my Annabelle. Okay. Okay. Kyle Rath, Bailey Hanna, Austin Skellinger, Clint Simpson, Katie Mays, Nathaniel Bibbs, Chelsea Sawyer, Michael Malman, Cody Owens, Christine Ann and Anna Stout. Anna Stout, so Thank cute. You. Her dad bought her an Annabelle membership for Christmas. Oh, that is so cute. So sweet. So sweet. From her dad, Byron. And then I have my spoopy shout outs. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. Happy birthday to Allie from your twin, Casey. Sending some love to Logan and Lily from Joelle. A big I love you to Chris from your daughter, Elsa, a.k.a. Grub. Sending some love to Lauren from Corinne. And last but not least, a little shout out to June Ann from Tanner. Hey, June. Um, oh, I should say June Ann. I wonder if we, what she goes by. I don't know. Maybe, don't maybe know. she goes by June Ann. Maybe, yeah. she's a down, maybe she's a Southern girl. Oh, it's so cute. Well, anyways, June Ann, if you could give your attention to Tanner right now, he has something very important to ask you. Whoa. Nice. Well, what if it's nothing? My God, you what, just... What, what if he's like... What do you want for dinner? What if he's like, are we going to finally try it? And it's like some sexual thing. Oh, I thought you were going to mention the demon box. <laughs> <laughs> get, get inside the box, Junan. Get in the fucking box! No? Okay, I, don't, okay. I don't think that's what's going to happen. Okay. Uh, that, <laughs> that I just noticed it looks like I don't have a head today. Look at like my... <laughs> floating? <laughs> I'm floating. Uh, that, that is all for today. Um, thank you for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scared to death podcast.com. Uh, you can email us for everything else. Info at scared to death podcast.com. Uh, thanks to Logan Keith uh, for social media, uh, badmagicmerch.com design, 
Uh, email store at badmagicproductions.com for customer service. Uh, producer Sophie Evans, thank you for help with story curation. Joe Paisley for producing and directing today. Zach Cohen for custom sound bed creation. And Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails. Yep, that's everyone. Subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. It's at Scared to Death Podcast for the pictures that go along with the stories and more content. And we have a private Facebook group, Creeps and Peepers, with over 11,000 horror-loving members now. Yay! Thanks to Liz Hernandez for... Uh, uh, you know, moderating that. And if you don't want to hear more ads, if you want bonus episodes and extra content, uh, check us out on Patreon and enjoy your nightmares. Creeps and peepers, happy holidays and hope you were scared to death. Happy, happy this. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but has no home here within scared to death.